What is it? Oh. Hello and welcome to Godless Bitches 2.0. This is a show produced by the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a nonprofit, educational, and we like to work on separation of church and state as well as promote a positive atheist culture. Uh, we have uh, Tracy Harris over here. Hey. The wonderful, marvelous. And a special uh, host today is Jeffrey Blackwell from American Atheists. Say hello, Jeffrey. Hi, how are you guys doing? We're Good. doing really well. Um, Godless Bitches 2.0 is a show that aims to raise awareness of civil rights issues, progress and setbacks from the past and present, as well as a discussion of what we hope will be realized in the future. Um, I wanted to clarify that because the fan mail that we get, emails and so forth, indicates that I think they think we're still uh, just worried about or concerned with one issue, feminism. Okay. And also, uh, this show is not about us, it's about issues. So asking if we want to be on your show or you be on our show because you're a podcaster, if you're a civil rights podcaster, yeah. But otherwise... Yeah, that's actually a good opportunity to talk about it. Like when we rebooted the show, mm -hmm. so there were things that I think, um, you know, everybody had suggestions and recommendations. And one of the things that I brought up was I wanted to broaden the scope. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, there's, you know, it's, um, there are so many issues that fire me up that are not necessarily related to feminism. And a lot of what was happening at the time was racism. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I was saying was, I think it should be more open to more social issues and social problems that we're addressing. And I think the, the, what we came up with was the idea of um, looking at these social issues from a feminist perspective. And so, yes, it is absolutely more broad now. Uh, it's not just gender issues. It's not mm -hmm. just, you know, um, feminist issues. It's mm -hmm. uh, issues that concern basically anybody we feel like that's getting unfairly screwed as a demographic. Right. We are for equality on all fronts. And uh, I this show has just been such a joy to me. I have really enjoyed doing this. Um, let's see. We will be having a special show a week on the 19th. That's two weeks from today. We are going to be filming live from the Women's March here in Austin, Texas. This is the poster from two years ago, and it was awesome. I couldn't make last year's because I was sick. But this year, we're going to film live, and you'll want to tune in, if for no other reason, to see this amazing jacket that I found. You have to see the jacket. Um, oh, and by the way, Happy New Year, y'all. Yeah. This year has got to be better than the last. It just has to. Lots of good things happened, but it's got to be better. Um, okay, so... What, how do we want to start? Do we want to talk about this issue that we have specifically invited Jeffrey here for? Um, or if, I think if you have things that you want to get off the table before we start that, mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. I would like, I, I would really like to take advantage of Jeffrey being on the yep, show. And once we get this. talking to him, I'd like to continue. It might be that certain things come up during the discussion with Jeffrey mm -hmm. that are good segues to sort mm -hmm. of asides. And yeah. then we can sort of take yeah. those paths as they come. But right. uh, I'd really like to take advantage of the fact of having him on. Absolutely. And I also want to get to, I have a bunch of, quote, good news to talk about. Uh, we often talk about the things that are not going well. This past week or two has been full of lots of great civil rights news, and I want to celebrate that. So, Jeffrey, tell us about yourself and uh, why, <laughs> why what you do is pertinent to what we're going to talk about. Um, well, I'm litigation counsel for American Atheists, which means um, <clears throat> I handle the... Um, litigation side of, of our um, work. My boss, Allison Gill, um, handles uh, the um, sort of lobbying and advocacy side, um, getting bills passed, opposing bills and policies, rule changes, and 
uh, state, federal, and occasionally local um, government. Um, so anytime you hear that American Atheist has sued somebody, that's probably me. <laughs> um, me in partnership with whoever we have as local counsel in the jurisdiction. Okay. Can you talk about some things that you've been involved with recently? Sure. Um, right now we have um, three cases in active litigation. Uh, the first um, is a case involving a, a, a young, um, at the time, I believe 10 year old boy in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, who was baptized um, against his parents' will um, by a um, sort of a big brother mentor. Um, the, and he's, he's also uh, neuroatypical. And as a result of being baptized through full immersion baptism and not really knowing what was going on, um, he had a number of adverse um, mental um, effects, I guess is a, a, a fine way of putting it. Um, so we're um, uh, giving his family their day in court so that they can um, hopefully um, impose some changes on how Big Brothers Big Sisters handles um, uh, training on these sorts of issues, um, uh, perhaps have some effect on um, church's ability to um, or perceived ability, I suppose, to baptize minors without the consent of their parents. Um, usually, um, a church regards a baptism as, you know, an introduction into a relationship with that organization, which, um, you know, if uh, you can essentially consider that a, a, a contract agreement with the organization that in certain respects, you're going to um, behave in certain ways toward them, they're going to behave in certain ways toward you. And a 10 year old boy cannot consent to a contract. I'm <laughs> stunned that that so. would even be done by the church. Yeah. Th that's just stunning. Yeah, and I, I would like to just point out, I mean, I don't know the answer to this question, but I have a pretty big assumption about it because years ago I was involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters and they, I don't think, would support something like this. Um, is it the case that this is just like the individual's decision here and that this was, I mean, I would think that when Big Brothers Big Sisters was apprised of this or made aware of it, that they probably were sympathetic to the family. Is that the case or am I wrong? So um, there's a difference between being sympathetic and doing anything about it. Sure. Um, oh. And uh, I mean, we're still in the process of going through discovery, which is an aspect of, of litigation where everyone is trying to collect. All Do you know if that person is still a big, big brother, big sister? Was it was a big brother. I think you said it was a, a he. Um, I, I, I don't want to get into that. Oh, okay. So, so, okay. That's fine. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to pry too much. I'm just curious. No, because, it's okay. Uh, if, um, if there's anything that I'm, uh, yeah. you know, I just not, remember like for them, safety of those kids was, you know, first and foremost, the welfare of the children was like the big thing when I was, I mean, from when I remember, but that was many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure it is and it should be. Right on. No. Okay. So the um, second one. Uh, we also have uh, a lawsuit going on down in Houston, Texas, um, which uh, involves a, um, at the time, a high school student who, for much of her time in high school, sat for the Pledge of Allegiance for both religious and philosophical reasons. Um, and as a result, um, received a lot of negative um, treatment, both, uh, both from other students, which is, you know, the right of other students within reason. Um, uh, but also from administrators and teachers, and and that's a problem. And also that the the administration did not, it seems, um, adequately enforce the school district's anti-bullying policy when it came to other students' treatment of her, um, which um, raises its own concerns. So um, we have brought a uh, civil rights lawsuit against the school district and um, and a number of teachers and administrators in the district. Can I ask you a question that's um, not specific to that one? Uh, at sure. my kid, my, I'm in Austin, Texas, and at my kid's school, they are required to stand unless they have permission from their parent to not. That yes, seems, that. should that go to the Supreme Court? That seems wrong to me. Is it because um, they're minors? Uh, 
So yes, Texas law uh, says that uh, the school can require students to say the pledge unless the parent exempts them. Um, now it's my position that it's the student's free speech right. This, uh, you know, it's not whether the student is expressing an idea that the parent agrees with, um, and placing the burden on uh, a student to get the approval of a parent before uh, sending, you know, or, or expressing what could be a controversial idea in their family um, is itself a, a burden on the student's right to free speech. Um, the other side of this argument um, claims that uh, parents have a right to due process and that um, the school allowing the student absent any input from the parent uh, to make that decision on their own um, uh, violates the parent's due process rights. Um, I don't buy that argument at all, but that's the argument that they make. And I believe one circuit, the 11th circuit, um, and I, don't quote me on that, <laughs> um, but I believe that one circuit has, um, has said that the balance between the student's free speech rights and the parent's due process rights um, leans toward the parent's due process right. And so uh, in Florida, as a result, they can have you know, a requirement that the parent is responsible for exempting the student from the pledge uh, recitation. Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> I want my kids to have that sort of autonomy. Okay, so, and number three? And number three is a lawsuit that we filed um, in Arkansas against a state senator who uh, was blocking constituents from his um, official I'm your state senator Facebook page and Twitter account um, because he doesn't like atheists. This is Jason Rapert. He um, is responsible for the Ten Commandments monument on the Arkansas State Capitol grounds. Um, he's he's um, a bit of a kook. Okay, so our president does the same thing. He doesn't he um, block people. He, 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 tried, he right? did. He yeah. he was blocking people from his uh, at real Donald Trump Twitter account for a while. Mm -hmm. at um, a lawsuit up in New York, um, the Southern District of New York said, oh, my, <laughs> my, my lights are motion controlled. I'm going to have to do my calisthenics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So there's, there's a reasonable explanation for that. Right? Yes. Okay, good. It's not just that it goes dark when you mention Trump. <laughs> No. <laughs> the dark lord okay. no um so uh the uh, columbia university's knight first amendment institute uh filed a lawsuit in uh conjunction with a number of individuals um who had been blocked by trump from his twitter account saying that his twitter account constituted a um, designated public forum mm -hmm. and uh which is a, a free speech uh concept and that by blocking people because they criticized him uh, was viewpoint discrimination and um, wasn't allowed and the court agreed. Um, we um, are, are basically using the same theory um, and applying it to this state senator's Facebook and Twitter accounts that he has um, used for government purposes, letting people know in his district about public safety issues, um, government's job openings, all sorts of different issues that are, you know, um, part and parcel of your, you know, elected representative's job. Um, it wasn't that thing with Trump, like um, the idea was that since this was an official communication avenue of the White House, you couldn't really keep people from seeing it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You could keep them from commenting on it, but you couldn't keep them from having the information because he made it an official avenue. Well, but even keep even preventing them from commenting on it. Um, oh, I thought they were, he was allowed to silence them, not allowed to block them from from seeing the feed. Oh, I, I think I misunderstood what you were saying. Yes, okay. he, um, for instance, if, if you're a an administrator of a Facebook page and. Uh, and someone is saying something on your page that you don't like, you have two options. You can block them, which prevents right. them from participating in the page and commenting or, or anything like that. 
or you can mute them, which just keeps you from seeing what they're saying. Okay, yeah, and on Twitter, I think I was, I don't know what the terms are on Twitter, but I, that was the thing, that he could keep people from commenting to him, but he couldn't um, stop them from seeing the feed because it was official information. Um, he, if uh, I'm not sure that Twitter allows a mechanism for, um, for him to prevent him, uh, prevent the messages from getting to him as opposed to preventing someone from uh, delivering the message at all. The, the issue for, for his Twitter account Maybe was... I'm confused. <laughs> it could be. I'm it, not big on Twitter, so... <laughs> it, it happens. Okay. Um, yes, the, it uh, so <laughs> I don't do Twitter either. So. <laughs> um, so on Twitter, if you are blocked from an account, you cannot see the messages that are posted. You cannot retweet or reply to the messages that that account posts unless you log out of Twitter, view the account that you um, want to see, then you know, screenshot or something like that, then log back in and then post whatever comment that you want to, uh, to comment, which is a barrier to uh, someone exercising their speech. And essentially each tweet is, um, allows a conversation to take place beneath it in the comments. And sure. by blocking somebody, from commenting, you prevent them from effectively taking part in those conversations. Um, so his Twitter account is a is a public forum, and he cannot block people specifically because it prevents them from commenting on those tweets and taking part in the conversation. Okay. Oh, good. I'm just I'm so glad we have at least one happy thing, uh, uh, one way that we can push back. I feel like Trump has been so good at silencing anybody who doesn't agree with him, and, and that terrifies me for one thing, but that the law came down on the right side on that one, I'm so glad. I, I feel like too often it doesn't. I'm sorry. Like, you, you're right. Very often it, it uh, comes down the wrong way for a multitude of reasons. For civil rights, in, in my view. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So those are your three things that you're working on right now. And that are, those are the ones that are in active litigation. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing those things, the, that good work for um, those of us who believe in, in uh, reason and civil rights. I just, I can't thank you enough. Nope, um, you're very welcome. And I'm happy to do it. So. Yeah. Um, so the reason Tracy asked you to be on the show, maybe I should turn this over. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, yeah I mean, there was some whispers a while back. I didn't pay that much attention to it other than think it sounded kind of weird about this pro-Israel pledge to not boycott Israel that was being required, I think, of government contractors. I had just heard, you know, a little bit about it. And it didn't really hit home, I guess, until... I saw an article about a teacher in Pflugerville, which is right near us, like our neighbor. So a teacher in Pflugerville who was like a speech pathologist and she was, um, she happens to be of Palestinian heritage. It's not that that, that's not that relevant, except that it explains why she would maybe have stronger feelings about this pledge. And she basically said that in good conscience, she could not sign a pledge saying that she wouldn't ever boycott Israel and then she ended up fired or asked to resign or you know they wouldn't renew the contract however you want to put it she was out of a job because she would not promise to not boycott Israel mm -hmm. and a lot of folks thought that was a really bizarre thing so we posted it on the GV page we I posted it on my page you know people were outraged by this and it starts to I think get into these bizarre it gets into a little bit of a bizarre, you know, expression, um, you know, like your personal expression outside, not not only your personal expression outside of where you work, but also the idea of um, this situation with Israel being having these weird sort of veneers of religious overtones, right? Like you can't mm -hmm. really separate it. So there's these intertwined religious arguments that happen with uh, in addition to the political situation that's going on. And it just seems that asking somebody um, who hails from Palestine to say, I'm going to support Israel, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, that they have to uh, in a way that that impacts her on, on this level. Like you can't work unless you're going to so, yeah. support it, our ally here and you can't basically protest. Uh, and that's 
that just seems really counterintuitive to freedoms. Yeah. So does, is that what they mean by you can't boycott, you can't say demonstrate against Israel? Is that what that means? Well, I mean, boycotting obviously is a form of demonstration. I mean, yes, she, as far as I know, she could still go out and hold up a sign that says that she's not with Israel or, you know, something like that. But so, there's a, there's a, there's an international boycott that is a, like a, a boycott that's going on. Mm-hmm. That has a name to it, like acronym or something. And um, you're not allowed to participate in that. What does, what does boycotting Israel look like? I, not buying products from companies that are associated with Israel. Okay, right. So uh, you can't say that you're not going to buy those products. That you're, and as a teacher, that's relevant. How? Because I, I, te- well, frankly, the Texas governor says Texas stands with Israel, and so uh, we our sense. government stands with Israel, our contractors stand with Israel, Lordy. and he has basically said that we stand with Israel, and if you don't, then you know you don't have a place here. Wow. And. I was hoping that um, Jeff could give us some kind of background into this and fill us in and talk about the the aspects that would relate to us as folks who, for example, we might not be supportive of like a Zionistic aspect of it as an atheist and want to say, hey, I'm in on this boycott because I think there's a lot of evangelical support on this thing for religious reasons and I don't like that in my politics. Mm-hmm. So can you just... Tell us what you know about the background of this thing, and then also, you know, what are what are your views on on any sort of um, cases that might come forward and how they might fare? Sure, sure. Um, so the the story on this uh, really goes back um, to the 1980s, if I remember right, when um, uh, Saudi Arabia and a number of other um, Arab nations had um instituted boycott of Israel and there was a, a uh, law that prohibited um, certain uh, commercial entities um, if I remember right from uh, participating in foreign uh, in, in boycotts led by foreign nations and the Supreme Court upheld that at the time um, eventually that, movement died away. Uh, then this uh, new movement, um, BDS, um, and uh, boycott divestment, and there's a, there's, <laughs> and there's a third one, <laughs> um, to, uh, to quote uh, Rick Perry, I believe. <laughs> um, uh, that is a... Um, sanctions, that's your S. I just looked it up. Sanctions, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, EPA. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, uh, there's this new movement now that is not led by any foreign country. It's, it, it, it's, um, local to the U S is my understanding that is, you know, trying to put uh, put pressure on Israel in much the same way that people put pressure on South Africa during apartheid. Um, which by the way, was, um, never subject to any sort of, uh, regulation by the government, um, as to, you know, prohibiting people from participating in anti-apartheid boycotts. Um, mm. At least not that I'm aware of. I've not come across any cases in which someone is challenging some sort of government restriction on their ability to speak out against apartheid. Um, so now people are, um, you know, putting those same uh, tools to use in, um, you know, trying to end some of the, um, treatment of Palestinians uh, in the occupied territories. And uh, and I, I don't want to get too deep into foreign policy because that's really not my area. Right. Um, but as a result of this movement, uh, a number of states, I think 27, have passed um, or are in the process of passing uh, laws like this that prohibit um, people who contract with uh, the government from uh, participating in such a boycott. Um, now it raises, yeah, it raises, a, uh, a, your, your question was, you know, I think how this affects, uh, you know, people in the atheist community and, uh, and people who are in favor of secular government. And uh, it has serious ramifications, I think, because, you know, even if, even if someone right now, um, you know, isn't really aware of this issue, um, 
and, and it hasn't taken any sort of position with regard to you know, two state solutions or Israel right. and Palestine generally. Um, state governments are asking them uh, to pledge uh, that you know, so long as the contract is in effect, they won't ever decide to do that, um, which uh, poses its own problems. Uh, then there are the people who are engaged on the issue and who um, are participating in the boycott. And um, they are essentially being blocked from um, being able to bid for government from, contracts. Yeah, expressing their views. Or being able through, to work for the government. Yeah, expressing their views through the, um, you know, through money um, or risk losing their um, ability to uh, contract with the government. And um, it's a, it, it has some serious ramifications. All the, the different states have the, you know, every state drafts their law a little differently. For instance, there's a case going on right now in the Ninth Circuit um, in uh, coming from Arizona, where a uh, a lawyer uh, in you know sort of a solo I don't know if he was a, just has a very small office or if he's a solo practitioner, um, but he um, had to um, basically in order to comply with. Um, all the regulations uh, and, and that come along with working um, as a lawyer, sometimes in partnership with the government, um, he had to pledge that he would not, um, as a company, boycott Israel. Um, and he disagreed with, with that. And it's now being appealed up to the Ninth Circuit. And the government has some really interesting arguments about um, about why this should be allowed. Um, number one, that uh, the biggest one being that um, this kind of boycott is not an expressive activity, which strikes me as bizarre. Um, essentially, they say, well, the Supreme Court has said it's not a boycott if you have, if it also requires you to explain the boycott in order for anybody to understand that you're expressing yourself through so your purchasing decisions. That doesn't. Um, um, I, <laughs> I won't, I won't go too deep into it because I think we could spend the entire, um, uh, day talking about that argument itself. That's just <laughs> my mind. I mean, essentially any commercial boycott would require you to say, you know, to explain why, what you're Absolutely. doing. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm thinking I, just in terms of something as simple as someone not eating meat. There are so many reasons a person might make that choice. Mm -hmm. And to assume that, you know, they're doing it for ethical reasons or they're doing it for health reasons or they're doing it for, you know, just environmental Ecological. reasons. Uh -uh. I mean, there are so many different reasons that unless the person tells me why they're doing it, I don't know why they're doing it. <laughs> Chipotle or Panera, because their um, ridiculous uh, promotion of we don't use GMOs, um, I, I find... I, Either they think I'm an idiot or they're idiots and don't realize that they're causing harm by having that kind of policy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, unless I, unless I say, no, I am boycotting them, um, people would just think, oh, he just doesn't, you know, like Chipotle. <laughs> um, right. uh, the, the, particular, uh, uh, the particular facts of this Ninth Circuit case is uh, that he, you know, he wouldn't buy anything from HP because apparently HP has a relationship with um with israel um and and the government the government's argument is essentially well you know maybe you know people would just think oh he decided to buy a brother printer or a lexmark right. printer instead of an hp printer therefore his decision to express himself this way is not expressive yeah um, i know a lot of people that won't eat chick-fil-a that don't do papa john's it's like absolutely you know hey. this could just go on and on and and like you're saying there is no pragmatic observable difference in that behavior than simply not liking the pizza from Hambajan or not liking the food from Chick-fil-A. So otherwise it's not a boy. That was one of the things that hit me about this, right? I mean, basically the reason that this particular teacher is fired is because of her personal integrity that she would not lie. So otherwise, 
she could absolutely participate in this boycott and simply no one would even know that she was participating in this boycott. But it was to her, you know, the, the fact of, of knowing that in, in herself, you know, that saying that if I were to do this, if I were to sign this contract and then silently do this, I'm basically lying. Um, and she was unable to bring herself to do that. And so for that, she got fired. But in reality, there could be a ton of contractors currently contracted who are boy- in, got involved in this boycott and getting away with it simply because they're not expressing it openly. Mm-hmm. You're exactly right. She she did the she wanted to be honest, and as a result, she got fired. Yeah. Um, but it's an unenforceable it's, thing unless yeah. you have somebody with that level of integrity, right? I mean, this is an unenforceable, like, how do you know that a company is, mm-hmm. it, like you said, not buying HP because they prefer another product or they have a better relationship with this other company or, you know, how would you prove it? Um, you would have to, you know, they, they would have to be, you know. They'd have to express it somewhere. And, <laughs> yeah. and say it. Um, Which would be the same with any boycott. And, and you know, take taking the government's position to its logical conclusion, um, no boycott is free speech. No boycott could be protected by the First Amendment because refraining from doing something requires some explanation if anyone's going to understand that you are, um, you know, that you're making a conscious choice uh, based on some personal view you have. Um, uh, So, I'm uh, I'm really interested to see how this Ninth Circuit case comes out. I don't think it's going to go very far. Um, I don't I don't think their arguments are are going to fly. Um, uh, one thing I think that's particularly telling now, um, and, and not to get too lost in the weeds here, but in in the Pflugerville case, um, all we have right now is the complaint. The complaint has been filed in federal court um, in I think the Southern District of of Texas. And the government has not responded. We don't have the government side in, in that case. Um, in the Ninth Circuit case, I mean, we have the trial court decision um, and we have the government's brief to the Ninth Circuit expressing their position. I don't know what um, this uh, law office's attorneys are going to argue in response, but there are a number of things I think that are telling in the Ninth Circuit case, at least. And I, you know, we can't talk much about how the um, the Pflugerville case is going to go because we haven't seen the arguments yet. All, sure, all and Texas is pretty that. creative. I mean, they've they've found <laughs> ways. No, I mean, they have found ways to allow things that other states have had to ban. Mm-hmm. I mean, Texas is, we mm-hmm. still have the Ten Commandments monument because we came up, not necessarily with the best argument, but it was like a technicality about the statue itself that allowed right. it to stand in Texas. It and had been there for 40 years and was one among many statues on the... Oh. But I think it had like something to do <laughs> with the base of it. Um, you know, like something about the way it was mounted that made it unique. And I, I remember reading about it and just thinking, my God, like who, who dreamt this up, right? I mean, our attorney generals are are almost diabolically brilliant here mm-hmm, in Texas mm-hmm. when it comes to finding ways to subvert, you know, any sort of... Or I guess to promote religious privilege. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, so so before the, we forget, oh. you said there were three things that the uh, that the government said this was okay by, and you started with talking about it's not. Uh, I can't read my writing right now. <laughs> not an ex. Uh, so um, let me let it. me pull up the. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about how a boycott. You, if you have to express it, then it it doesn't it's it's not okay. And you said there were two other things that the right. government was defending this with. Um, the government is saying that, um, and I'm just gonna, I'm basically going to read from the table of contents of the sure. brief. Sure, no, go for the it. Easiest way for me to accurately say what their argument is. Um, uh, first, that uh, it's not protected under the First Amendment because it's not ex- inherently expressive. Um, <laughs> then that the um, the state's compelling interest in prohibiting people from boycotting Israel um, outweighs uh, the uh, in the business's First Amendment rights. Um, 
How? I don't. That's their argument. I don't. I don't know. I, I, I don't can, get it. Uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm reminded of that uh, gif that's been going around of the the guy that Jake Tapper tells you don't have to swear on a Bible, and he's just like. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, it like, seems like they would. I can't articulate to, it. Well, in, in order to curtail somebody's rights, you would have to demonstrate some sort of damage that goes beyond, you know, the, the exercise of those rights. So I get, uh, I can get the idea of them saying, you know, hey, basically, it sounds like what they're saying is we can prove that people participating in this boycott is more damaging to Texas than. than well, this is be Arizona. Allowed. Oh, okay. So this is the so Ninth Circuit case. You said. Circuit. Yes, I got it. So basically, what they're, <laughs> they're that makes sense now. We're talking about yeah. Arizona, so yeah. now it makes sense, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, so they're they're somehow going to have to show that there's you know more negative impact to the state than positive impact to the individual in participating in this boycott. That's what they're basically claiming they can demonstrate. Right. A, yeah. a um, viewpoint discrimination, um, if if it is to be justified. Um, has to survive what's called strict scrutiny. Um, so the government um, has to be acting in pursuit of a compelling government interest. The measure imposed has to be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest, and it has to be the least restrictive means of achieving that interest. Now, um, I cannot conceive of a compelling government interest um, that is served by preventing people from expressing their views on uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict, you know, in whatever, you know, <laughs> right, just <media>. personally <laughs> or, or through yeah. a corporate, you know, means. Yeah. No, their, their argument essentially is um, we, the state cannot be required to subsidize someone's um, first amendment expression. Um, and what they're, the little sleight of hand that they're doing, which might be very familiar to, uh, you know, the atheist community of Austin's audience is they're changing from um, someone's ability to simply enter into a contract for services with the government as a subsidy. Um, and, and that is a little bit of, of linguistic sleight of hand um, that I, we should all be uh, fairly familiar with in various religious debates. I, I, yeah, um, I'm sitting here thinking right now about like how we do um, funding. There's some funding that goes to religious private schools. I so appreciate your uh, talking to us, Jeff, because I hear this stuff and I think that just doesn't sound right. And you're confirming that <laughs> it doesn't sound right. It's not right. It's well, I mean, that's that, that's what they're going to be arguing. When, when is when will they be making these arguments? So they filed their um, the government's brief was filed just this uh, past December. Okay. The um, uh, the plaintiff, well, now appellee, um, his brief is due, I believe, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And then the oral arguments. I'm not sure if the oral arguments have been scheduled yet. Okay, okay. That'd be. I'm um, curious to hear to follow this. I just. I'm very curious how they're going to try and make this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they argue. It's in front of the Ninth Circuit, so I don't think that the government is going to get a favorable decision at, at, from the appeals court because the Ninth Circuit is is one of the more um, liberal yeah. and progressive. Um, yeah, appellate they lean toward the rights. Yeah. Yes. And um, the real question is, um, once they lose at the Ninth Circuit, how is this current Supreme Court going to treat it in um, a year or two when oh, they boy. inevitably grant cert, uh, grant um, the... Yeah. Um, and and I think it, 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 it's also um, or interesting to me. To hear the case. This I don't type of a thing is coming mainly from the folks who say they are so against government overreach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, one distinction that can be drawn with the Arizona case is that it specifically deals with corporation, with businesses and, and, um, and corporate boycotts. Okay. Um, whereas the Texas law seems to deal with individuals as well. This is just well, one teacher. Yeah, I mean, she wasn't just a teacher, though. She was, I guess she was like a, a speech pathologist, like a specialty, you know, instructor or whatever. And she was hired on um, a little, a little, I think it's a little different than just like a normal teacher 
being just hired contract essentially and yeah. and by the way i believe the only arabic speaking um speech pathologist in um in the city yeah um, she actually is weird it's like she speaks so many languages i was looking at her resume and she's so qualified it's ridiculous and um it just i it's a think i mean thinking that it's damaging to texas to not i guess to I, I, I'm trying to do this with negatives, and I probably shouldn't have. It seems to me it's damaging to Texas to not have her on board. Yeah. Like, yes. I would say that she the state benefits a great deal by having somebody so qualified in that position to be able to help students of, in so many languages um, and to be able to you know, do the speech pathology and basically saying, well, but if you won't buy... If you won't buy a Hewlett Packard printer for your house, because she's a person, she's not like a huge right. company, then you know we we're gonna fire you because hey, that's damaging to Texas. You know, it's like this. one thing that's one thing that's really interesting about this controversy is that it seems to cut across political lines. Because yes, to a certain, particularly in Texas, you've got you know people who are for small governments. Um, corporations are people. Um, and are deserving of all the rights of an individual, um, and also who are firmly in favor of, you know, the constitutional provision protecting the right to contract. Um, now saying the government has the right to restrict the speech of a company or an individual um, it, because they refuse to enter into contracts with um, uh, other people whose, you know, circumstances. Oh, yeah. I mean, just oh. examples here in Austin, right? So we had an ordinance that said that you can't use uh, plas like plastic bags. You have to use like the reusable bags just mm. for an environmental thing. Here in Austin, you have to use, you know, buy your bags and just use your reusable bags. And the other thing we did was that we passed um, a little ordinance that just said that, hey, if you're a company that's over a certain size, you need to uh, give your, your employees paid sick leave of up to like a week or something like that. Man, the state legislature just came down on us like a ton of bricks. And they were, they were like, you can't put this on a business. That is so wrong and so restrictive. And how dare you tell these businesses how to run them, you know, their own companies and that they have to give paid sick leave. And, they, and you can't restrict them from using these bags, even though most of the companies that are doing the bag thing now are actually selling the reusable bags. I mean, it's not like, as far as I know, there's not like a huge uprising of the companies and the grocery stores saying, oh my gosh, we, you know, we want to hurt the environment with these throwaway plastic No, they're happy to sell, bags, send, right? sell I mean, me a reusable yeah, bag. Yeah, because so happy. many people show up at the store mm -hmm. and it's like, I forgot my bags. Would you like to buy bags? I guess I have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just this thing about, you know, you can't put any regulations on businesses and then here they are. Right. Really, I remember trampling. I used to. My first job was at an HEB, uh, which is a grocery store in Austin. Yeah, and um, you know the the amount of money that the store spent on plastic bags. I'm sure they're happy to start selling reusable bags and make money on bags yeah, instead of, instead of giving them bags. away, right? Like forever. Exactly. But it's it's not only Texas and Arizona. They. Uh, New York, New Jersey, and California have passed these same types of laws with broad support. Um, I can only presume because uh, they people they don't want to risk I don't know being painted as anti-Semitic if they're in favor of allowing people to make their own decisions on this issue. Um, so it's not just a conservative. Um, or, or, you know, Republican problem. Um, this is cutting against the interests and positions, um, broadly speaking, of um, a, a whole swath of, of the country. And it makes absolutely no sense to me. Well, it, it, I guess part of it is usually the conservative states are the ones that are saying that they're okay with the bigoted position and that, you know, people calling them bigots are the ones who are, you know, way out there, the snowflakes and the, yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking at it like, this is so weird to, <laughs> to hear 
of you know a conservative state like Texas even being if, if they were you know if, if part of their concern is we don't want to look anti-Semitic that would be like the first time ever that they cared about looking bigoted. Right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, maybe if they knew oh, that it makes them you know not look bigoted, they would true. stop supporting this okay. thing and you know oh, repeal it or something. I don't know. It's maybe really I, weird. I, I don't know. Um, I, no, and I should say that the third argument um, raised is that um, essentially the um, what people are doing by boycotting companies that have a relationship with Israel is discriminating against Jewish people. Um, oh, so there they're going to admit that it has to do with religion. Yes. Suddenly um, we're going to acknowledge that. Right. Basically, uh, part of the argument is that, well, if we... You know, we have laws saying that the government can't provide, um, uh, you know, con uh, can't contract with people who discriminate on the basis of religion. And by um, refusing to contract with Israeli companies, you are discriminating on the basis of religion. Um, oh, gosh. And yet all of the policy... Yeah, that is so, surrounding it, Israel. That's what I said. There's not there's, about religion. There's like a diabolical what, genius to the way they argue sometimes. Right. The it's boycott would go it. away. It's the, finest. <laughs> the boycott would go away if Israel changed its policy with regard to Palestine. It is not about their religious right. views. It's right. about the government's actions toward another group of people. Um, oh uh, yeah, I, the, the the argument just doesn't um, oh wait. So, but that's the argument that they're raising. Um, whether or not the Ninth Circuit, I don't think the Ninth Circuit is going to buy it. The Supreme Court under the you know, current makeup might. Mm -hmm. um, okay, footnote here. Everybody who either didn't vote because it doesn't matter or <laughs> voted uh, through their vote away on something to, Woo. quote, make a point, this is why voting yeah. matters. Yeah, thank you very much. And yes. you can send me all the angry emails and stuff Woo. you want to. It's, it's a, <laughs> we are here because people don't vote. Uh, but no, we, well, but we go can't. to the polls. Yeah, we can't. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, and honestly, if somebody is supporting fairness and justice, then I'll be the first one to say I don't care about their party affiliation. Yeah, exactly. It just so happens it's that just, where I live, there seems to be a trend. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's they're, they're still individuals. Uh, every representative has their own views, and, you know, they got to be judged independently. Wow. Uh, uh, anything else on this just particularly horrible thing? Well, you were going through that uh, yeah, table of contents. Was there oh anything else gosh, on that yeah. that we hadn't hit yet? Uh, let me let me see here. Yeah, um, please. Because so. I do have some good news later, y'all. <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> we'll get there. Oh my god. Okay, let me let me just. I'll run back through them real quick so I can. If there's anything that raises something that you guys want to talk about, uh, yeah, feel free. Uh, okay. Plaintiff plaintiff being the. Um, the attorney in this case um, who wanted or may engage in a boycott. Um, plaintiff's boycott enjoys no protection under the First Amendment because it is not expressively, uh, inherently expressive. Inherently expressive. <laughs> there are the lights. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, then it, it points to a number of cases that are um, uh, not really on point for various reasons. Um, Interesting. Uh, but that they claim apply here. Uh, mm -hmm. One case uh, colloquially called FAIR, in which um, a, uh, uh, a law school challenged the requirement uh, that schools receiving federal funds have to allow military recruiters to um, come to campus. Um, one called... <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> One wow, called. that's clever. I mean, that's creative. I, I would, I, you know, there's a part of me that I really want to look at these arguments when they come out because I'm, like, I'm just like, how? Wow. And yeah. they have in their heads. I mean, they're putting this stuff down because they have in their heads crafted why this is relevant. And mm -hmm. They're not putting this stuff down at random. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll send you the, I'll send you the, the brief that I have. Um, okay. Just in case you want to peruse it at your, at your leisure. Um, uh, they claim it only incidentally burdens a person's free speech. Um, I don't know how uh, they claim that uh, a statute requiring people to refrain from expressing a particular viewpoint um, 
is only incidentally burdening a person's ability to express <laughs> that viewpoint, but they argue it nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, just Wait. for a moment, I mean, it's like they're they're basically saying that she has to, like this teacher, now I know this is a different case that you're okay. reading from, yes. I get it, but in the case of Texas, they're going to be saying that, you know, this teacher has to support Israel, right, that she, she can't not buy products produced by Israel for the purpose of objection, mm -hmm. and it makes me... It also interests me because these are the first people who will completely object to having to support, like, like to to sell a generic cake to a gay couple, right? Because they'll say, "Oh, you're so stepping on my rights to when I have to sell food to somebody who's gay," um, and. They don't even have to put a message on the cake, right? Like nobody's forcing them to put happy gay wedding on the cake. <laughs> they just, you make and sell cakes, just sell them a cake, done and done, right? And yet the same people who freak out that they're being, I mean, they, they don't even want to let a trans student use the bathroom that they identify with because they feel like you're forcing us to, to promote transsexuality. It's like, no, we just want this person to be able to use the bathroom and not get beat up. Is that too much to ask, right? And so you have this situation where anytime they're told that they, like I said, they can't be bigots about something. It's no, you're not asking you to, to wear a neon sign that says, I support trans people and you know I love homosexuality. I mean, just don't, just do what you would normally do. Right, we're not telling you that you have to go shop at the gay grocery store or whatever. I don't know what how to even compare it, but it's like just treat them like you would treat anybody, um, and you don't have to. They don't have to buy from them. They don't have to buy goods from them. Just you know, don't discriminate, and they're. It's like they're doing this thing now. That is exactly what they rail against. They are doing it. It's not like they're doing it. Well, it's, it's, it's weirdly, there's a, there are some weird differences, though, because there's a difference between me refusing to serve someone, right, versus me refusing to buy from some, patronize someone. Like, not patronizing a business is my right. I'm not going to make the baker go in and shop at a gay at a store where the proprietors are gay, mm -hmm. no one's going to force them to do that. I'm not going to tell them that they can't refuse to shop there. Mm -hmm. They can, but it, what it's almost like it's almost like if the state was saying you have to shop at stores owned by gay people, um, and if you don't, the government won't work with you. Yeah. And, and it's uh, along the same lines, you know, you can't compel someone, apparently, according to some, to buy uh, health insurance. Um, but you can compel someone to, um, I, I want to be careful because they're not compelling people to, to contract with um, companies that do work in Israel. They're just saying you can't. You can't uh, not. You can't. Yeah, you you can't <laughs> you can't blanket say that you're not going to. Yeah, um, you can only it, do it if you lie about it. I mean, it, it's really it's really bizarre. It is, uh, and it, it's it's bizarre on so many levels. It's bizarre that it's so widespread. It's bizarre that. Um, like, I, it's not like the teacher here in Texas is saying, "I refuse to work with an Israeli student. I will not." do business with a student who is from Israel or a kid that's Jewish. I won't work with that kid. She's not right. saying that, right? She's saying, I will, I am willing to work as a speech pathologist with anybody, any religion, any national nationality. Like she's not saying she will not work with somebody from Israel that they, that, that she refuses her services to them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, she's literally just saying, you know, I, I reserve the right to not buy Israeli product. That, that is precisely all that she's saying. And, um, and however, on this particular point, um, Texas has seen fit to say, well, you can't express that view and be employed by the government. Um, and, and I should say, there are very clear um, 
cases dealing with the free speech rights of government employees. Now, you know, she's, it's unclear to me whether she is a contractor in, in, in that she is not an employee of the government, but rather an independent entity that provides services to the government under a contract. I think versus she is. a contract employee, like many teachers are, um, you know, under uh, term contracts, but they're still employees of the government. Yeah. I mean, uh, they're all subject to it, right? I yes, mean, they are all subject. So it's just. Yeah. Uh, so are there any other cases that are similar where we have boycotted a country? I think you already spoke to this, but where we have boycotted a country and then you require government employees to not purchase, to, to also boycott them on a personal level. Is there any other instance? Well, I mean, we have things well, like we you, know, you can't buy Cuban yeah. goods That's not what stuff. I'm talking about. Well, that's kind of the same thing. Well, see, if I'm, if I, for me, what this means is, is this teacher, like you said, can't buy an HP printer at home. Well, right? she can. Well, she, she, she's your, she, wants the, she wants to be able to not buy one. And and to be right. able to say it's up to me what reasons right. I don't buy an HP printer. So do they have they had that sort of requirement on any other for any other country? So if we're boycotting, uh, it's just weird like because they're basically saying that they're supporting Israel for religious reasons, and therefore if you boycott, you're boycotting for religious reasons. Reasons, and that's somehow. I mean, and this is Arizona, like you said, this isn't. They haven't made the Texas argument, but if we, you know, were to translate that, they'd be saying that um, she is somehow discriminating against, you know, a Judaism in this boycott um, because the state is choosing to support Israel as this weird national religious evangelical move. It's really weird. But like South Africa, let's if we're Apartheid. boycotting okay. yeah, if we're boycotting South Africa and I work for the government, I'm a teacher, and they tell me I can't purchase any or I can't not purchase not purchase something made in South Africa. Has anything like that ever happened? It's it, weird. It just it just boggles the well, mind. Well, it's like you can not buy it, but you can't not buy it for these reasons. That's what makes it so bizarre. Why yeah, are they dictating what an individual can and cannot do based on government policy? And I based don't. on what their motivations are for doing right. so. But, um, I mean, if you're in the military, I've often felt that they kind of own you and they can tell you where to go and what to do and so mm -hmm. forth. But if you're a teacher... Or you work at the post office. Okay, so let me let me ask it this way. Let me just go ahead and throw this out there. So if I, if they were to say, you know, this amounts to anti-Semitism, like you're being anti-Semitic by by engaging in this boycott, that's what they're trying to. Say. And someone else says, hey, if you if you had a teacher that came out and posted a bunch of racist crap, and you fired them, people would say that's justified. Mm -hmm. So what is the delineation here? Uh, the motivation behind, uh, and I don't want to draw, uh, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. Um, you know, if if I engaged in this boycott, it would be because I object to the way in which Israel is behaving toward um, the, you know, the occupied areas, mm -hmm. um, not out of an animus toward Jewish people. Um, right. There may be people who, because they don't like Jewish people anyway, well, this gives me a sort of, you know, um, fig leaf uh, cover for doing that. So I'm not going to say that some people don't have, um, you know, ill will toward Jewish people and are as a result participating in the boycott. Um, but the boycott itself, the, you know, the BDS movement, um, and I'm just now realizing that that's BDSM and whatever. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the BDS movement um, has nothing to do with how people feel about Jewish people. It's about how people feel about the way the Israeli government is conducting itself. And that is um, a, a huge distinction. I get um, that. But isn't it pretty clear that the the United States involvement in this is 
because, uh, and this is what I've read. Now, I, I, I admit that my what comes into my feed is biased. So correct me if I'm wrong. That um, support of Israel is very much uh, supported by the fact that evangelicals feel that um, Israel is important to the second coming. Am I right? And I. I, I think that a substantial amount of the support for the way we have engaged with Israel uh, in the last 30 years is, yes, a result of okay, uh, so of Zionism. Not, yeah, I'm not nuts on that. Okay, so there it is about religion, basically. Yes, right. I think I think in part the government's motivation for imposing the restrictions <clears throat> is motivated by religion. I think so, too. I, that's what I think is weird about it. It almost seems like a religious oppression as opposed to protecting a religious freedom. Mm -hmm. it, it's like they're imposing a Christian um, and a Jewish religious motive onto people who maybe don't want to buy into that. Like you have to do this because this is our religious perspective that this is the right thing to do. And yet the people who, have, who are, uh, this is so backwards and forwards confusing, it, but in fact the whole relationship with Israel is because of religion. Well, no, kind I, of. I, I mean, well, the Holocaust. I mean, there's yeah. Uh, the, the, Britain gave the land over as a result of reparations after World War II, and they had I'm, all kinds of stipulations I'm that have since flown the coop. The Zionism stuff. Yeah, that's all religious, and that's gone back before is before right. the re, the re, renovate, you know, the the reinstitution of the state of Israel. That you had that going on with, I think, even Napoleon mm -hmm. um, was into that, but. I, I think what's weird to me is it, it's it's kind of thought police. I don't know of any other thing that is like if you're buying something or you're not buying something or you're doing a thing for legal reasons, mm -hmm. I can't understand saying it's illegal to do it for this subset of legal reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, a boy boycotting is not illegal. We're, we're allowed to boycott. Mm -hmm. And so if someone says, I'm not going to buy this because I'm boycotting, they're saying, no, that's that's the, we're going to we're going to cut off that contract with the government. You, you cannot contract legally contract with the government and also not buy this product because of a boycott, which boycotts are legal. And in the same vein, though, you can contract with us and not buy this product because you prefer another product. You can contract with us and not buy this product because your brother-in-law gets you a good deal on a different product. Um, you, you know, it's it's like you you can have all these other legal reasons to do it. And certainly, you you can have a legal right to to purchase a thing, and you can't purchase it to do something illegal with it. Right? I can't I can't buy a gun to go out and murder somebody. Right, but I have a right to buy a gun, and in this case, what I'm saying is, they're basically saying if you if you want to buy the gun for home protection, that's not legal. If you want to buy it for hunting, that's legal. And it's like, but it's okay to protect my home. Like there's there's no law against home protection. Like people are allowed to protect their homes, right? So mm -hmm. it's weird because it's not even a distinction of you're doing this for some reason that is illegal, or you're going to do this and you know you're driving your car um, because you're escaping a bank robbery. It's mm -hmm. your getaway. Well, that's not legal. You can't be driving away from the scene of a crime, but you can. But you certainly have a right to drive your car. But they're kind of saying you can't drive it to the grocery store, but you can drive it to the library. This gets back to the cake thing, though, to me. It's not the same species or genus, but maybe the same family. I can... The, the cake is okay to be made and sold as long as it goes to something I, I agree with, but not if I don't agree with it. What the hell difference does it make? It's a cake. Make it and sell it. Same thing. It, it's like the, the flavor of it is what they're objecting to. It's the same feeling to me. The, yeah, the it has a weird, and so that's why I have to look at it and say, imbuing. you know, why do I support the the sale of the cake, right? Mm -hmm. Like the indiscriminate sale of cake, but I don't support stopping her from not purchasing this product. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is that she's not denying somebody her services, right? She's not saying I refuse to serve. Now, I would probably be against her 
if she was saying, I will not work with Ju- with Jewish students. Yeah, that's different. Then I would be all over that, right? Because mm-hmm. that would be apples to apples with not selling the cake. Right. And I would say she's on the side of wrong in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, but when she basically says, I don't want to buy these products, well, you don't have to buy products. Oh, I'm not talking about her uh, decision. I'm talking about the way the the, the government views this, yeah, this action. Yeah. It's, it's strange because they're trying, yeah, they are trying to use that weird same concept of discrimination, but it almost in a, in a backward way. Mm-hmm. That That's ends up saying. thought policing people and saying, saying, but w- yeah, but why don't you want to buy? It? I don't have to justify <laughs> purchases I don't make. <laughs> like that's absolutely wild to me mm-hmm. yeah. that I would have to that I would have to offer a justification for not buying a thing personally. Tracy, if you get really sick of whatever you're doing in life, be a lawyer, please. <laughs> <laughs> You can do so much good. I don't know. <laughs> we have a lawyer, thankfully, <laughs> yes, I, here on the panel today to, clear to check more. me when I say <laughs> wacky things. But no, it's not wacky at all. But yeah, it's just so it's so backward that they would rail against the cake thing mm-hmm. and then try to make somebody justify non purchases exactly. in her in her person. It amounts to that's, her personal life. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, it does. Oh, I, I agree. Oh, thank you. Um, I, this is the whole past couple of years have been so full of gaslighting. It always feels great when somebody says, "Yeah, that's horse crap." Thank you. Oh, this. Uh, I'm I, glad I, that. You know, you just read so much <laughs> of it, and it's like, really, for real? Have have we lost our minds as a society? Okay, no, we haven't. They're just some no, it's very just, powerful. It people. is though, like through the looking glass, where you go into this weird upside down land. You know, where you're allowed, where they want you to be able to not be able to sell goods to to certain <laughs> members of society, but then force someone else to buy things. Mm-hmm. Like that's well, yeah, and and you can't use this bathroom, but we're going to force you to use this other bathroom. Yeah, I would it's, never force people to buy a thing. Right. You know, and mm-hmm. I get, and even, even, isn't even that one of the, their, uh, that's one of their talking points against um, the Affordable Care Act, right? Is you can't force people to buy insurance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? You can't force people to buy things. And like, what are we doing with this woman? Yeah. We're trying to tell her she can't not buy something. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, Texas is part of the lawsuit saying you can't force people to buy insurance. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> by the way, um, I have not read it, but it's my understanding that Texas joined on to one of the amicus briefs that was filed in the Arizona Ninth Circuit case. I um, wouldn't doubt it. So I'm interested to read their arguments there because I imagine that you'll see some of those same arguments in response to um, this teacher in Hoogerville. Yeah, this is a trip. I Is there anything else on that table of contents? Where are we at? What <laughs> Where? Um, Wait, there's more. I don't even know Wait. how we're doing on time, or I'm not even paying there's attention. The clock out there. Oh, is there? Oh, good. That's, That's so much easier to see. That's for me, because I can't see very well. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. We talked about the state's compelling interest outweighing oh, the yeah, first yeah. We did. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the First Amendment does not compel the state to subsidize plaintiff's boycotts, even if they cannot be outright prohibited. We, we talked about there, they're, they're playing fast and loose with um, subsidy versus just, you know, being able to contract with the government on the same grounds as anyone else. Um, and they claim that the, uh, the district court's preliminary injunction is um, too broad. The, the district court imposed, uh, put an order in place saying um, until the resolution of this case, the, the uh, government cannot enforce the Arizona okay. statute at issue. Okay. Um, and apparently they say that that was overbroad. Um, and um, I, so this is a 70 page brief and I have not gotten yeah. yet to the, uh, to the part where they talk about that. Well, that's not mm-hmm. unusual so right, for them know. to put a restriction on something like that when it goes to court and say, Hey, you need to do business as usual and not enforce this law until we figure out what's going on. I mean, that's not unusual at all. There's a word for that, right? Like a, not like a stay, but, what do they call that? It's, a, it's a preliminary injunction. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. When when they basically say this, this law doesn't get exercised until until we sort this out, right? And there is, uh, you know, you are required to make um, uh, some some fairly substantial 
um, uh, you know, showings in the courts in order to have a preliminary injunction imposed. You have to, you know, for instance, the plaintiff in this case would have had to show that that he was um, substantially likely to um, to wind up the victor in the case. Um, which is an interesting, <laughs> an interesting thing to prove without mm. simply proving the case. Right. Um, That's interesting, but it's how it, how it works. I was um, not a, even. I was never aware of that. I learned that like just this moment. Uh, yep, yeah. um, and that that you will suffer irreparable harm um, it, uh, unless um, a preliminary injunction is imposed, and and a violation of a constitutional right is an irreparable harm. So, um, you know, so that is that is satisfied by. The fact that this appears to be a restriction on his free speech rights. And so, uh, this teacher, why has she not received that? Where are we in? So, well, Texas uh, is in a different state. I know. Of, I know. of uh, litigation, right? Like she's right. filed. Like she uh, yeah, she has filed a, a complaint. There yes. may be a, the balance of interest is a little different here um, because um, it, it's a question of employment. So the uh, Perhaps her lawyers feel that the state would have a better argument for whether or not the state would be um, harmed by the preliminary injunction in as much as, you know, they would have to be paying her and there's really no, uh, there, there would not at the end be a mechanism for them to recover that money um, other than the plaintiff filing a fairly substantial bond with the court. Um, a teacher's uh, salary? is un really it, it, I, i'm just speculating on what their arguments might okay. have been and <laughs> See, i don't I've been a teacher they don't make any money uh, she <laughs> may she may be seeking a preliminary injunction okay uh, i i am not sure um whether or not right, that's right. the case um she as far as i know just filed the complaint a couple of weeks ago okay um, she could still file a preliminary injunction i think okay. um uh, I, I don't i don't the top of my head no reason why she couldn't mm -hmm. um, and she may have already and I'm simply not aware of it so. right sure and then because uh, I'm a parent I'm thinking about okay what about the kids that are not getting what they need and uh, those sorts of pathologies are oh, yeah, time sensitive and, and if you don't get them in you know the window of time sometimes you can't recover from it I just wow all over something just patently absurd patently absurd yeah all over really the question of so can you justify why you're not buying these products yep yeah yep. and the by the way the texas law is incredibly vague so it's not even clear going back i think all the way to the beginning of our discussion mm -hmm. you were saying you know it doesn't uh, prohibit her from you know going out and, and protesting mm -hmm. about israel's you know conduct um or advocating for the boycott it's not entirely clear from the text whether or not that would be allowed. Oh, okay, um, okay, no, it's a good clarification. And, and yeah, part of the argument that she's making is that the the statute is so vague that she doesn't know what she is allowed to do. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. that makes uh, sense. Oh wow, okay. <laughs> is is that the table of contents? I think we're um, good. I mean, if you yeah. wanted to move on to you know a few other things, and, right. and Jeff is free to stay if you want to come and just sort yeah. of play with us for the next 15 minutes or so yeah it's gonna be good stuff <laughs> i'm i am i am happy to stay on i wanted to um just take a look real quick and see if i, I have the language that's in her oh. contract that she refused to sign okay right on let's um, hear it uh pursuant to section 2270.001 of texas government code the contractor affirms that uh it does not currently boycott israel and will not boycott israel during the term of the contract Boycotting Israel means refusing to deal with, terminating business activities with, or otherwise taking any action that is intended to penalize, inflict economic, economic harm on, or limit commercial relations specifically with Israel or with a person or entity doing business in Israel or in an Israeli controlled territory, but does not include an action made for ordinary business purposes. So there's some question of whether her, you know, saying on Facebook, I support the them. boycott, um, you know, limits commercial relations specifically right. with Israel or, or in some way penalizes. Mm -hmm. inflicting yeah. economic harm on yeah. Israel. So it, it, I think, I think there's a strong argument to be made that 
that it goes beyond simply her economic decisions. Sure, I understand. Yeah. And that because of that, it's far too big. Dang. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, uh, are you all ready for some good news? Some <laughs> things that have happened? In, Absolutely. In the feed has been, my Facebook feed has been full of all sorts of fun things. Um, so, um, Mark, or, or is it uh, uh, Phil out there, whoever's going to drop the first image, I'm going to talk about the Judge Dana L. Christensen. Talk, that's, talking let's drop about that images image. dropping. I didn't mean that, but there you go. Oh, boy, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny. All righty, then. Image <laughs> dropped. Okay. Uh, so uh, the district court for the, Mon uh, for the District of Montana ruled uh, that the First Amendment does not protect Andrew Anglin, a publisher of the neo-Nazi website Daily Stormer, from liability for his decision to launch an anti-Semitic troll storm mm -hmm. directed at Tanya Gersh, a Jewish real estate agent in Whitefish, Montana. So, yay, civil rights working, doing the right thing. Um, that's a good thing. All righty, and uh, that wasn't actually that bad. Okay. Um, another thing was uh, three Kansas Republicans switch parties in one week. Um, I was I lived in Kansas for ten years or so, and it's pretty hairy there. Uh, so Stephanie Clayton, Dinah Sykes, and Barbara Bollier. Uh, that's Stephanie Clayton. Uh, Dinah Sykes is the next photo, and then Barbara Bollier. This is what she said, and I just. Um, Love this. State Senator Barbara Bollier was the first to defect last week, citing her disgust with President Donald Trump. She told Salon's Matthew Rosa by email last week that when Kansas Republicans codified a statement against transgender identity in their platform, coupled with the blind support of President Trump's intolerant and dictatorial style, my moral compass said no. Wow. Love it. So now these are representatives? Uh, Kansas, three Kansas Republicans, uh, yeah, state senator. Okay. They're state senators. Wow. Yeah. Um, so three, and supposedly there are going to be more who defect uh, from the Republican Party to go, to move over to the Democratic Party. And I, I double-checked this because it's, you know, a salon. And there are videos of her being the staunch Republican. And then if you go to her website right now, she's Democrat. It's pretty awesome. She said no more of this stuff. Trump did not remotely represent her value system. And that the state party's anti-transgender proclamation, which reads, we believe God created two genders, male and female, was the final straw. I support the people of Kansas. I do not condemn whoever they are. I thought, yes. Someone just has. imagine if if Kansas had a rule saying you can't change your party registration if you're doing it because you oppose one particular uh, public official's uh, perspective. Uh huh. Same thing. <laughs> well, I think what's interesting about that though is that that's almost a Bible quote, right? Yeah. Male and female created he them. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's literally you're, they're not supposed to be promoting specific religion, mm -hmm. and I can find the passage in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That where that quote comes from. Yeah. So there's that. And then as a scientist coming from the other side of this, it's not true. There oh, are yeah, not. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I get it. I'm I mean, just saying it's like so weird that yeah. they would put in language that is pretty much lifted out of the Bible. Lifted out of the Bible. I'm not saying that there are no other religious texts that would right, right. have similar language. Right. But certainly. Um, so separation of church and state, problem there. And then if you're a scientist, there's intersex and then there's gender. There's all sorts of ways that's bad and wrong, and that's science, not opinion. Good Lord. Okay, so right on. Reason has won there. That's nice to know. Okay, and then a new Democratic lawmaker hangs the trans flag outside her office on Capitol Hill. Oh, Mark or <laughs> Phil or whoever said, yes, look at this. It's delicious. I love it. It's hanging there. Jennifer Wexton, a D Democratic for Virginia representative, placed a transgender flag outside her office on Capitol Hill on the day of her swearing-in ceremony on Thursday. Thank you to everyone who knocked on the door and made a phone call 
on this campaign. This flag is there because of you, and for you, my heart is full. <laughs> and I believe, uh, so she's actually kind of in my backyard. I, I live in right Arlington, on. and I think she represents Fairfax um, and some other areas, uh, and also uh, it represents uh, the district, uh, the, uh, forgive me, the Virginia State District um, represented at the State House by Danica Rome, uh, who you guys might be familiar with. She was the, um, a, a transgender woman who was elected to the State House last year. Okay. Um, and uh, um, I, I think it in part may have been a, a bit of solidarity with, uh, with Danica, but uh, who can say? Right on. It's kind of interesting. It made me chuckle that... Um, you know, I'm so excited, as are a lot of people, to see so much diversity sweeping in, like, mm-hmm. after the midterms, like, seeing so many uh, minorities, people of color, women, um, moving in. And there was someone on my on a feed, I don't know if it was on my feed or on a feed on social media that was just like, you know, well, why does it matter? Oh, God. And uh, it reminded me of something that I heard recently. There was an interview with Nancy Pelosi and, you know, regardless of your feelings on Pelosi, just, you know, the content of what she was saying, someone had asked her, her they were asking her about her history in politics and how she got involved in it. And she described how she had all these aspirations and then she ended up getting married and then she ended up having a kid and then she ended up having another kid. And, you know, she started having kids and then it was sort of like that became my thing. Like I was mom and, you know, wife and that was it. And then after her oldest daughter got to graduation age, she decided for whatever reason, I'm going to run for office. And she had like, you know, political history in her family. So this wasn't like her family was completely divorced from this. But what was interesting to me was she said that male politicians asked her, why do you want to run for office? Why do you want to be in public service? Mm -hmm. Right. And um, goodness. I, I find, and and when she when oh she said one of them said to her something to the effect she's like the attitude was kind of, well do women have issues or problems that they need addressed because mm-hmm. if they do they could just you know let us know what they are and we'll we'll address them, mm-hmm. and it's like oh so you can just sit down and you stay out of politics and you just let the men take care of it and you don't need to be sitting in a seat mm-hmm. with us and working with us and you don't need to be get your little pretty head involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I posted a, a little cartoon with this particular post, and it had a picture of two male stick figures at a chalkboard, do, one of them writing a mathematical equation. And the other one says, boy, you suck at math. <laughs> and then there's another square next to it where it's the same picture, except the one writing the equation has a little skirt on, so she's a little you know, female stick figure. Mm-hmm. And the other figure is saying, boy, girls suck at math. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, kind of sums it up, right? So it, it's sort of like you have this, you're treated like this big demographic, you know, that why in the world would you want to do this? And it's like, I don't know, maybe for the same reason you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Maybe because I, you know, it, you, you wouldn't, it, this isn't the kind of question that you would get asked if it was like a male colleague who was an up-and-coming mm-hmm. politician. He wouldn't mm-hmm. say, well, what, what are, why do you want to run for office? Like, mm-hmm. do you have some issues you could just tell your standing representatives? And, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. hell, if that's how it worked, we would never have to have elections, right? You could just contact the person who's your yeah. representative and yeah. tell them you have an issue. And, uh-huh. I mean, the reason people run is because, you know, repres- yeah. it's about representation, yeah. right? And yeah. while I do get the idea that, you know, someone can be more representative. There, there are certainly um, women who would not be representative of me, right. and I get that. Yeah. But to say that um, people who share my experience in society are generally going to be less likely to represent, I don't mm-hmm. believe that for a second. And there's a lot of times that I have, you know, spoken to very sympathetic, very um, enlightened uh, men that can't understand something and it takes me a great deal of effort to explain it to them mm-hmm. about, you know, the the reality of, of what it is to live in this society as a woman. Mm-hmm. And I watch sometimes the light bulb go on, right? Where it'll be like, mm-hmm. oh, I get what you're saying mm-hmm. now and mm-hmm. I understand what you mean mm-hmm. by that. And, it, and it's like, yeah, and most of the women that I hang out with, mm-hmm. if I were to say this, I wouldn't have to explain it for three days. Right. Or, you know? <laughs> oh, three days, you're lucky. I mean, my, my husband, I adore him, been married well, I've been with him for about 20 years, and it and it's only in the last 
several years. It's taken me years of sharing with him my experience as I've gone right. through life, how different it is for yeah. me than it is for him. I, it goes, it's everything from uh, just walking down the street to getting a job, everything is different. Um, and I think most men are kind of dismissive at first because it's not their world, but then over and over again, all the little things that are pecked to death by ducks, yeah. I love that, um, that make my experience, and damned if that doesn't matter, uh, to have women, minorities, all of the differences represented in government. Um, and with that, if uh, Phil or Mark, I don't know who's going to do this, but I have images that were posted on Facebook that just made me delighted, showing the diversity of the incoming Congress. Is, that, is there, do you have those figures? Can we drop those? There we go. Look at that, as emojis. Oh, I love that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. And, and speaking of like all this diversity, I just want to make mm -hmm. the point that while I am on the receiving end when it comes to people not understanding the experience of, mm -hmm. of general, the broad general experience of women in society, mm -hmm. I don't want to say, you know, we're not homogenous either, but there is mm -hmm. still, a, you know, a, a social context in which people mm -hmm. have to navigate. Yes. And on at the same time, there are times when I'm outside too of someone mm -hmm. else's oh, yeah. reality, right? Absolutely. And so I'll have to look at that. And there, I have, you know, I'm so grateful to my friends, um, who are on social media who are trans, my friends who are black, because there are plenty of times, even the disabled community as well, mm -hmm. right? And so I'll go into those uh, feeds and there will be something that somebody's saying and I I'm, I don't even understand what they're saying. Like mm -hmm. they'll be complaining about a thing and I'll be like, well, why is that a problem? Mm -hmm. And I don't even, I don't even have to ask. I can just go on the thread and read the complaints of mm -hmm. all the people within that community saying, oh, I can't stand when someone does that to me and they will definitely explain it. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to post to say, I don't understand why this is a problem. Mm -hmm. You just have to listen to what they're already mm -hmm. saying because they're all going to jump on that and say, here's why this is a problem for me. All right. um, and it, all it takes is, is listening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even, you know, and, and uh, I have learned so much about the experience of other people that I would never have clued into if they hadn't expressed it, Yeah. Uh, especially in those three yeah. communities specifically. It's right. just huge yeah. for me. I've learned so much yeah. from, from just going in and seeing what it is about their experience that is different than mine right. and why and, and what it is to live in their world. Not that I know how to, what right. it is to live in their world, but that I can understand why they would be averse to something that to me seems really harmless. Mm -hmm. And then I start reading how it impacts them. And it's like, mm -hmm. whoa, okay, yeah. yeah, that's not harmless. Yeah, that's why Callie Wright's podcast has been so meaningful for me. It has opened that window. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I took a course. I went to uh, KU, and in the same city, Lawrence, Kansas, there's Haskell Indian College. And I took a course there, and it opened my eyes. The probably, well, from everything I've read, one of the most underrepresented um, and maltreated groups are Native Americans. And almost nobody knows about what uh, sorts of things the various tribes endure. Um, so with that, there are now two women, <laughs> Native American congresswomen. Yeah. I am so thrilled about this. Uh, they are, let me, um, uh, Deb Holland, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of the Pueblo uh, of Laguna tribe and Sharice Davids of the Ho-Chunk Nation. This is a big deal. Yeah. Um, here in Austin, if you are in Austin, uh, on the first Saturday of every November, there is a powwow here. If you haven't gone, do. It is amazing. Um, before you go, if you do, learn the etiquette. Uh, there's a lot to know. It's not a costume. It's an outfit or their dress. It, uh, to, to say it's a costume, just think about that. It's not a costume. Right. It's their traditional garb. Um, so, and don't don't just walk up and take your picture. They're they're not things. They're people. Ask first, that sort of thing. Um, anyhow, so good to see that diversity there and Native American women. Holy crap! That is big. That is yeah. big. And congratulations to them. Um, yeah, I really think that this is going to be a year of shock. 
<laughs> for the House, <laughs> if not the Senate. I, I think that they're going to be shocked at yeah. how often they, they get the, uh, w- just a moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and called out on, on the bigotry that they are so so normalized to that they don't even mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. And when they start getting schooled and stopped and questioned on every turn about, wait a minute, why are you assuming this? Because, you know, I'm trans or I'm, you know, I'm a woman or I'm a minority or, you know, I'm a person of color. And uh, what you're doing there, do you understand the implications mm-hmm. for the group that I represent? Mm-hmm. Because you you can be sympathetic to it, but you really, living it is a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. The House actually, um, I think for the first time, well, for the last 180 years, I think the House rules have prohibited the wearing of um, <laughs> Yeah, like headgear, <laughs> hats or whatever, yeah. And uh, uh, they they just changed those rules. Uh, yeah, they had to. to. Allow, um, yeah. for, the, for the headscarf. To allow for religious minorities to mm-hmm. be able to, mm-hmm. yeah, right, it's to like, imagine, wear what... Uh, and it was pretty recent till that women weren't allowed to wear pants. Right, that they had to wear skirts. Holy and, crap. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, it, it, and it just reflects the idea of of the the nor like what is normalized in the society versus what is you know not normal. Right, and, um, and that means that um, the uh, the house is essentially just a few years ahead of the Mormon Church because I believe the <laughs> Mormon Church just said that their um, female missionaries. Uh, don't have to wear a, wear a skirt. They can wear oh, pants. Oh boy! So oh, boy. that's that says that's a lot. how far behind that the rules have been. Yeah. On the other hand, this segues nicely into the documents that you can use to sign in on or swear in on. Uh, mm. Can you drop that uh, image? There's. It's got Bible, Quran. There we go. All of them and the U.S. Constitution for whom. Atheists, yes, and there are some atheists being sworn in on that. Yeah, and speaking of swearing in, how about the swearing in of the first openly bisexual woman? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, right? Kirsten, or I hope I'm pronouncing it right, (laughs) Kirsten Sinema. she was sworn I in. I, I, you know, the, I, wish, I wish they had the picture with the stole because here's the, the thing. The stole yeah. is awesome. I know yes. we're not supposed to make comments about the mm-hmm. women and how they look, but holy cow, the, the con- the, that chamber has never seen so much style. Right. Like that was the best. I saw yes. that outfit and I, I was yeah. just like, it sh- would, would that I ever look that good. I mean, <laughs> really. And yeah. it, not that it, you know, not that it matters. I know it's not, you know, mm-hmm. tied to her, her capacity. Mm-hmm. It was just yes. that I, I, I am not used to seeing a legislator look so damn good. And powerful. Yes. Powerfully <laughs> like, good. Wow. She she comes across like, do not mess with me. I just love the way she comes across. And she's being sworn in uh, with using the Constitution, yes. by whom? <laughs> Mike Pence. I love that. That is really funny. Oh, my <laughs> God. He's such a bigot. And I really, really hope that his wife was present to keep him from thinking sinful things. You know, because <laughs> that's how they roll. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I, I, sh- I, I should mention, she wasn't sworn in on, she wasn't sworn in on the Constitution. She oh. was sworn in on a uh, an Arizona case reporter, I think. Even um, better. Yeah. Even better. And, Something yeah. And not at all intimidated by Pence. She was having fun Clearly. with it. Clearly. like, there are tape marks for where their spouse is supposed to stand. And she's like, uh-huh. oh, can we get a spouse? Can we? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I'm just joking around. It, it was such a good inter- interaction on her part. Yeah, People, I, I th- they're just going to get so much pushback from all kinds of things like women's reproductive rights. Mm-hmm. This is going to be such battles. They're going to be epic. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I really hope this trend continues. Yeah. And I, yeah. people were posting pictures of like just the colors, right? Like mm-hmm. you can see the, the, like when you showed that little graphic, I was thinking that was kind of what it was going to be, but it was more of these little emojis. But when, but people were sharing photographs of the actual oh, chambers. We have like that too. Dark blue and gray yes. and black. Contrasting. And then you boom, can, color. Yeah, yeah, show how it used to be first, if you can show that photo first of all of the dark blue suits <laughs> of the, being sworn in. Yes. Oh, look, there's a couple colors, and who's wearing them? The the women, (laughs) I think that's a child in the bright, bright red. Okay, and now contrast that with the incoming house. Woo! 
Look at all that pretty colors. We got turquoise in there, and I think I'm half blind, but there's red and bright yeah. blue and all sorts of awesomeness and lots of different colors of people. Yes. And all sorts of gender. Yeah. Ugh, just so good, so delicious. Looking at that, it was all over in my feed. And the and it, young people, right? Yeah, young, young, young. Just yeah. such an infusion. And that's going to be another shock, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that oh, is yeah. going to be yeah. a, a cold glass of water in mm-hmm. the face. Women who are not ashamed to dance. Or to have sex or to, you right? know, woo, hey, yeah. what do you know? Right? Oh, my gosh. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, totally. I completely agree. And let's see. Then we can jump to something that's a little bit different. Uh, the photograph of the new astronaut class that's coming in. There are five women. Five badass women. And let me just tell you a little bit about each one going from left to right. Kayla Barron is an engineer and Navy officer. She already knows something about what it's like to live in tight spaces where a vessel wall is the only thing protecting you from a dangerous environment. The 29-year-old Navy lieutenant from Richland, Washington, was one of the first class of 11 women to join the submarine service after the men-only restriction was dropped. Wow. So she was probably serving on a nu- Navy nuclear submarine. Yeah. And, uh, Pretty amazing. Probably, yeah, right? And her reaction when she was free and free finally heard the news was appropriate. Quote, I was just over the moon, unquote. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Okay, the next woman over, Zena Cardman, is a marine scientist and microbiologist. I'm especially interested in life that lives in oddball environments on Earth, the extremophiles, Mm -hmm. says the 29-year-old from Williamsburg, Virginia. For me, it's a good analogy for environments that might be habitable on other planets. Cardamon is a multi-talented scientist whose bachelor's degree in biology included minors in chemistry, marine science, and creative writing. So she's, you know, many talents. And she hopes that her flexibility will make her the scientific Swiss army knife in the field. Yeah, she's the renaissance person. Right? Okay, and then there's Jasmine, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Mobelli. Uh, helicopter pilot, that goes out to you, Jen, and aerospace engineer. She earned both bachelor's and master's degrees in aerospace engineering and joined the Marines, becoming a helicopter pilot and rising to the rank of major. The next one over is Laurel O'Hara, research engineer and wilderness first responder. Growing up in Houston, her second grade class grew tomato seeds that flew in one of the space shuttles. So she's already (laughs) had her hands in in space stuff. And in high school, I used to watch the space shuttle debriefings when they used to do those in the space center. However, she tells students who dream of space not to be discouraged if they struggle with some subjects. My worst subject was actually math. She says, I struggled with math the whole way through. Those struggles, however, didn't stop her from getting a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering or a master's degree in aeronautics and uh, astronautics. O'Hara is also a private pilot, again, another renaissance woman, and an avid outdoors woman and has been serving as a wild nut wilderness first responder using her certified EMT skills to help people in trouble in remote places. Awesome. Like you do in your free time. (laughs) All right. And then Jessica Watkins, geologist and curiosity collaborator. I have no idea what curiosity collaborator, oh, I guess the curiosity of the machine, sorry, is a mechanical engineer with a doctorate in geology, which led to a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Scientists sciences at the California Institute of Technology, where she started working with NASA's scientific division as part of the team working with the Mars Curiosity rover. An avid athlete and a former National Rugby Sevens team member, she's also been acting as a volunteer assistant coach for the women's basketball team at Caltech. Oh my gosh. Watkins is an advocate for women, especially women of color in STEM, and she hopes that she can provide an encouraging example to a generation of mighty girls. Let's hear a roar. Rawr. That's just just freaking awesome stuff. Really good stuff. Um, I have a 13-year-old girl, and, and this is the sort of stuff that just I put her face in front of and say. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times people don't understand that um, opportunities you're not aware of are not opportunities. Mm-hmm. Right. So well said. Things like this, you know, somebody might think, well, you know, what difference does it make? But it makes a lot of difference to people who are given restricted and narrow 
confines to what they're being told they can do. Mm-hmm. You don't just think about doing something until somebody puts puts it in your face mm-hmm. and says, you know, hey, this is an option for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the thing. It's, you know, w- women in our generation, we, we were definitely – Given a little more freedom and a little more options, but I, but nothing like what I'm seeing now. No, and, and I'm so excited for what I'm seeing now. Yeah, I mean this this woman, uh, she just it just changed within her career that she could become uh, uh, a scientist on a submarine. Yeah, exactly. Men, as just within our 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 life, early late life. Excuse me. Um, so. There's all that good stuff. And now um, I have another thing I'd like to talk about, but we're way over time. I think we've had enough good stuff. I will. <laughs> too I will, much of a good too thing. Too much of a good thing. Um, uh, last time I did a little special thing on someone from history that everybody should know about, but nobody does. And I have another person I was going to do this time, but you're going to have to wait till next month probably because we're over time. Uh Thank you so much, Tracy. Sure. This was wonderful, as always. And, Jeff, thank you so much for being a part of this. You have enlightened me yeah. and reinforced that, that that I'm not just seeing things. And short notice, too. Thank yeah. you for squeezing us in. Yeah, the, we you know, really appreciate it, especially since you could set up the video and everything. That was fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can't think of much I'd rather do in <laughs> on uh, you know on, on a dreary Saturday. So <laughs> right this was on. a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. good. We're I'm, glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope you can come back to talk yeah, about too. other stuff sure. that has to do with civil rights. We'd love it. And Anytime. on the other side of that wall, Phil, Mark, uh, Eric, and Brent are doing stuff to make this happen. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be doing this. We just show up and talk. That's right. Right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. And let me remind you, this is from, thank you, Tracy, from a couple of years ago. But in two weeks, on the 19th, we will be filming from the Women's March. Uh, please join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. There it is. Woohoo! For 2019, January 19th, here in Austin. And uh, wherever you are, I hope that you can find a Women's March and participate also. Um, so, um, yeah. Just real quick, American Atheists is having our annual convention um, the weekend oh. of April 19th in Cincinnati, Ohio. April 19th. And, uh, it's going to be a great time. Um, I cannot wait. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is, absolutely. This is Feel my free. favorite time of year. So Right on. I didn't, we didn't even ask if you had right. anything you needed to plug, but if you should always. I just, I had to make sure I got it in, right? Yeah, right? absolutely. Thank anything you. else you want to share? Oh, we promise uh, we'll cut okay. you off. I think if you want to, uh, if you encounter any church-state separation issues uh, <laughs> where you live, please go to atheists.org slash violation. Um, right. And... Uh, that's a t h e i s t s dot org, um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, I'll see what I can do to help you out. Yeah. Right on. I can has justice. Yes, oh, I can yeah. has justice. <laughs> nice, nice. All righty. So I'm going to leave you with this one final thought. We don't need a savior. We have each other. It's all we've ever had, and it's all we'll ever need. Bye. <laughs>